Hey, thank you so much for turning up and joining us today. Um, I want to go through a couple of slides and uh, talk about what we offer at the School of Interdisciplinary Studies. Basically, we have 12 on-campus ma master's degrees covering international studies, diplomacy, gender, and media. We also have 11 online postgraduate degrees for students from over 30 countries and four research degrees. We have some of our graduates working for UN Women in Nigeria, managing risk analysis for Lloyd's Insurance in London, diplomatic services around the world, heading government relations for Global Corporation, PrEP, one of our graduates, press officer for the Red Cross in the Congo. Uh, we have manager for Heineken, we have NGOs in Palestine, and we also have many uh, students who work in media and in PR uh, in different parts of the world. The School of Interdisciplinary Studies, we have four teaching centers offering uh, cutting edge degrees on campus and online in international studies and diplomacy, gender and sexuality, media and communication, journalism, environment, development, and policy. The centers are the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy, the Center for Gender Studies, the Center for Global Media and Communication and the Center for Environment Development and Policy. And we also have the Research Center for Sustainable Finance. Why study at SOAS? What makes SOAS special? I think we, are, we have regional expertise in where, uh, in the world, in where the world is changing, makes our students competitive in the marketplace. We have the largest concentration in Europe of academic staff concerned with Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, we have a high teaching quality, consistently rated the highest level by our students, number one in London. We have the largest provider of graduate programs to the University of London International Programs, that's including our online uh, provisions. We have enthusiastic, uh, diverse, and dedicated students. The SOAS Library. Uh, is one of only five national research libraries. So what do we do at CIS? Um, we try and look through an interdisciplinary perspective on issues that concern us in the contemporary world related to questions of power, populism, development, climate change, international re relations, gender and sexuality, and um, other issues related to um, um, the Global South in particular, inequality and sustainability. And I stop here because I need to have my colleagues talk about the, um, the, the specialities of the Centre. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Dan Pesh. I'm Director of the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy. My uh, colleague uh, Dina Mesa already gave us uh, an overview of uh, uh, what we do as a whole in the school at CIS. Um, and I think maybe just at the beginning, uh, briefly uh, summarize some of the things I'm going to get into now. Um, people very often want to know uh, where do our graduates go? So uh, to answer that question, um, I was uh, running into a deputy ambassador uh, from a continent European country who graduated a few years ago at a reception we had here last night for the outgoing United Nations uh, Head of Human Rights, Andrew Gilmore, and uh, that uh, session was uh, full of our alumni who are working all over the world. My good cliche is that you find our graduates everywhere from the World Bank to the West Bank, and that's fairly true. So you find uh, business managers, uh, two of our students uh, who did pioneering work on the uh, foundations of women in the United Nations are now working, one in the Congo, one in Nigeria. If you look at the uh, online web portal for the uh, Intergovernmental Conference on Climate Change, uh, that portal is one, run by one of our energy and climate uh, graduates. Um, and of course, there are uh, diplomats in their services all over the world uh, engaged who come out of programs. Now, um, in particular, 
uh, in the context of SIS and of SOAS and its regional specialities, I think there are four things we would point to uh, within the context of uh, our degrees in particular. The first is, I think, great academic rigor. Um, and overall, sometimes I'll describe our degrees as a, something of a triple espresso or an executive master's degree because it is so intense. There's very intense academic rigor outside of the uh, Anglo-American uh, uh, paradigm. So you know, we would see the Renaissance as coming out of uh, Islam in the Middle Ages uh, rather than just out of um, uh, Italy um, in the early modern period, for example. Uh, we in our programs are uh, uh, almost obsessed with interdisciplinarity. So in one of our degrees, you can study the law and economics of corporations, where normally you would need to do separate degrees to uh, get to grips with key issues that employers uh, and indeed the public want and assume. We also integrate skills training, which is um, quite common in other uh, parts of uh, academia. In, uh, for example, um, MBA uh, schools, uh, obviously they're obsessed with the practice of business, but also often I think in the international sphere, uh, the skills set is uh, not included. And so we will help train uh, people in negotiation, in media training, um, uh, a policy analysis papers and so on and then integrated with our programs there are a range of study tour options depending on the program and these could be to North America uh, to Ethiopia uh, to United Nations in Geneva and so on these depend on the program so these I think are elements each one of which is a fairly um, exceptional a unique selling point and together I think they produce a pretty satisfied uh, student body. Um, what are our degrees? Um, well uh, our mainstay is on campus and online diplomacy with the world's largest provider of uh, diplomatic education with some 400 students either on campus studying international studies and diplomacy um, or the online version of global diplomacy and the online version is taught in collaboration with the British Foreign Ministry's own diplomatic academy, which I guess is a good thing that you might have said a few years' time and perhaps can play master of British foreign policy. Um, so these are, have regional specialities in the Middle East, South Asia, and so as is regions. Uh, and we also have very uh, high quality programs on integrating energy and climate policy. All too often these subjects are, are studied uh, separately and not in an integrated way. So for example, the Chinese and the Germans both have an interest in renewable energy as a means of reducing their imports from strategic partners in Russia as well as where it's um, a strategic problem. So we provide a strategic interest in renewable normal analysis, for example. Um, and yes, you can give a taster. Uh, and finally, uh, if you're interested in being in London, we have a range uh, of rooms in uh, the center and in the of uh, a short summer school courses. Uh, and we also have three online uh, mass open courses. And some 100,000 students over the last few years have studied our mass um, online open courses which take a few weeks. We recommend uh, incoming students take them just as a refresher to get into training. But if you want to know what we're about, they're also a good way of uh, introducing things. So with that, um, I'll hand back to, um, to Dina. I will look at uh, replying to your uh, individual questions, but I should also say uh, do be in, uh, in touch with me by uh, email and I happily personally have a, a WhatsApp call or something of the kind with any of you if you're interested. Back to you, Dina. Thank you. Um, so we have the next uh, presenter would be from the Center for Global Media. And it would be Dr. Somnath Batabial, who is uh, who's going to speak, speak to you in general 
around uh, what we do in media. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, Somnath Bhattabhya, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll give you a breath. You've heard where our students go to, and the faculties we are. I'll give you a brief overview of the degrees we do at Scalas, but, but more importantly, the question, why would you want to study media at Scalas? <clears throat> One of our main strengths is that unlike other universities in England and in London, our focus on the global south is very extensive. It does not mean that we exclude the global north, but as Dan said before, that we prioritize the global south, we try and relocate our main uh, arguments around case studies and empir uh, <coughs> empirical studies of the global south. Uh, we look at the media not in isolation, but in the context of global politics. So Trump's rise to power and his use of media would be part of our discussions in classrooms every day. We have a very healthy mix of theory and uh, case studies. Uh, our classes are divided into theory intensive classes and then in the second half of your degree you'll find that we encourage you to look at places of your interest or we present different case studies. You bring in practitioners. Another very important reason to study at SAS is the mix of students that you have and the mix of staff that you will encounter. We have students from all over the world. There are several languages of which, which are spoken. People come with different political, religious backgrounds that bring all their various experiences into the classroom. Our teaching staff, you will probably not encounter as diverse a teaching staff anywhere with the kind of regional expertise that we have at SAS. And you almost always find that somebody or the other is there to cover whatever region of the world you want to talk about. So as was a part of the Bloomsbury Group of Colleges, London School of Economics, UCL, they were all part of the same um, group. And of course, being in uh, Bloomsbury, you have access to the best libraries in London. Uh, we offer four degrees, one of them online. Um, MA Global Media and Communication, which is taught by Dr. Maka, who spoke to you uh, in the week. Uh, this program focuses on the dynamic developments in media and communication. Uh, it's one of the core modules which we teach. Um, it focuses on Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. It's 180 credits. 60 of them are the main dissertation that you will write 10,000 words at the end of the degree. And 121 thought, 120 thought credits, uh, which you have to take. Now, these can range from within the center, uh, or you will have access to the various courses which our uh, school teaches, interdisciplinary studies. But also, uh, if you want to move into economics, development, politics, you have choices uh, which are the law. Uh, international journalism, I convene that particular degree. Um, you will see that we call it international journalism instead of journalism. We think of journalism as uh, pluralistic, various forms of journalism are practiced. Again, in this degree, there is a very close connection with practice. One of our um, co-teachers is a practicing journalist at the BBC with several years of experience. We have visits to various newsrooms in London. Uh, we have um, we talk about global news in different parts of the South, uh, the South Asia, Africa, what forms of journalism are practiced, citizen journalism, new things which are happening. Um, so, uh, so you'll find a very healthy in this. Um, moving on, Zeme Media and Development. This, uh, while I used to convene this degree, uh, uh, now to be co-convened between me and another staff member, Dr. Vati Pokyon, and who's not here. Uh, in this degree, on one hand, it's a very theory intensive degree, which looks at development politics of the last century to present day conversations around climate change, environmental politics. On the other, it's also a very practice based degree, which engages you with the changing world of digital, uh, 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 digital politics and, and activism and how uh, you can engage with it both within larger organizations and as individual activists. The MA Global Media and Digital Cultures program has now online and you can look at it on your websites. 
We also have a very vibrant PhD community, uh, and you will find that within SOAS, you will find supervisors who will be able to work with you on your particular research areas, as, and as long as you're focused on the media, which between us and the center, the three of us will be able to handle and will be able to guide you in your various areas. Uh, we have uh, summer school activities, um, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence and global digital futures, which we'll be talking during this summer of 2020. Media and gender will be another one. We have a very vibrant weekly seminar series, which will run through the teaching uh, terms, both term one and term two. We have annual lectures each year, which you'll be part of. All in all, it's, uh, it's a vibrant, small community, and we have students ranging from between 30 and 50, so we have a lot of time with tutors and your fellow students. And I hope to uh, see some of you here. If you have any questions, do direct it to me directly at sb127 at soas.ac.uk, or I'll take them after. Uh, thank you so much, Song. And uh, now we have Center for Gender Studies. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name uh, Dr. Samia Khatun. Uh, I am a senior lecturer at the Centre for Gender Studies. So I'm just going to tell you about uh, what we do at the Centre for Gender Studies. We're a um, fairly new, young community in a sense in SOAS. Uh, the Centre for Gender Studies has only been around for uh, just over 15 years and it's a very, uh, it's a special in that it brings together a range of scholars from various different backgrounds to create um, a truly international classroom unlike any other that I've ever taught in before. Uh, it houses a range of postgraduate taught degrees and postgraduate research degrees in gender studies. So we're talking master's level programs and also a PhD program. So the um, the five degree programs that we've actually got going at the moment is an MA Gender Studies. We've got an MA Gender Studies with a Middle East pathway and that just, uh, you know, it's a regional specification, it's a regional speciality that um, for those people who are interested in that particular region. We've got an MA Gender and Security, we've got an MA Gender and Law and an MA in Transnational Queer Feminist Politics. And this last one, the MA Transnational Queer Feminist Politics, is, is the newest one we've got um, in our sort of palette of uh, degrees. Now, the reasons to study at the Centre for Gender Studies are many. It's an incredibly active research community. Um, the, we had a, a conference in May 2019 called Gender X, Decolonial Transnational Perspectives on and Beyond the Gender Binary. Because all the students coming to the Centre for Gender Studies are graduate students, there's plenty of opportunity for people to convene their own conferences as well as participate in the conferences convened uh, by um, faculty members. Uh, I'm about to give you a sense for the rest of the presentation of what it's actually like to study at the Centre for Gender Studies what the intellectual interests are and what some of the flavour of the gatherings. Um, the active research community, what holds us together is the seminar series. We've got a year-long seminar series in which um, there is actually a really active um, attempt to cross over that space between activist communities, policy networks and organisations and the intellectual work that we do at the Centre for Gender Studies. So for example, uh, just last week we had a roundtable um, on a world in revolt approaching global protest from a feminist perspective and we had um, students and um, intellectuals talking about uh, revolutions in Algeria, in Hong Kong, in India, um, it, and also in Iraq. So it, for, it allowed for the bringing together of feminist perspectives on parts of the global south that are never necessarily talked about together because we have the lens of um, you know, feminist thought sort of guiding um, how we're looking at the world, there's incredible opportunity in the classroom at the Centre for Gender Studies to actually bring together these very diverse places in the Global South and actually make for intellectual um, and political conversations that are not really possible in many other places in the world. Um, we also have uh, 
um, very, very, very exciting workshop um, series for PhD students, um, uh, which buttresses a year-long PhD um, MPhil seminar program that we do in the first year of the PhD. Uh, so the research community is held together not only by these courses but also by a number of visitors um, and what um, brings all of these uh, sort of different strands of the Centre for Gender Studies together is we're very committed to uh, sort of thinking through gender through a non-Eurocentric lens. Now, this is something you're not going to get anywhere <laughs> to the same extent as you do at SOAS. As has already been mentioned by my colleagues, the faculty, the student body are so international facing that this is a space from which studying gender in the global south is made possible by the incredible networks and expertise that the faculty um, actually bring to the classroom. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about the degree structure for the MA Gender Studies. Um, I urge you to take a look at the website for the other um, uh, degrees that I mentioned that we offer. But the MA Gender Studies is the one that is our most popular degree because it gives you the most flexibility. So it, it, it's a year-long course for a full-time uh, student and there's a dissertation at the absolute core of it. Um, what you do is a dissertation over the entire year and in addition to that you do a year-long um, theory course called Gender Theory. Now this again, the focus here is on non-Eurocentric perspectives on studying gender. Feminism is often thought of as something that has come out of the West. Well, here at the Centre for Gender Studies at SOAS, this is a claim that we challenge and the sort of Eurocentrism when it's thought, it, um, we're at the cutting edge of actually uh, um, questioning that, challenging that. Uh, so the gender theory course is at the uh, one of the four courses and the other one is dissertation and methods where so you really learn how to write and then you have your optional modules. Now, um, as my colleagues have already gestured towards, the breadth of modules available to uh, the students who come to SOAS are unlike any other. So as a Centre for Gender Studies student, you can do modules in, in Islamic studies. You can do modules in uh, romance in the Hindavi uh, canon, right? It, it is quite extraordinary the way that you can actually pick and choose depending on what your regional interests are and also what your disciplinary interests are. So I, the final thing I will say about um, in my presentation is why study at the Centre for Gender Studies. Now, if you are wanting to see the world through a feminist lens, this is the place where we will equip you with the tools to be able to think through gender, race, class, sexuality together in a way that other gender studies programs across uh, the UK and across the world are not quite able to. And this is because of SOAS's very, very, very unique location in looking outwards to various regions of the global south together. It is a portal to global feminist networks so I urge you to come and join us in uh, this community that is built on feminist principles. Um, if you have any further questions, please get in touch with me directly. You can email me at samia.kathun at soas.ae.uk. I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions. And uh, Professor Shankar is going to talk about the Centre for Environment Development and Economic Policy. Um, and uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Gina. Gina, hello everyone. Um, my name is Bhavani Shankar. I'm Director of the Center Development and Development Policy, uh, which we call SEDAP for short. Uh, and SEDAP in, in, in many ways nicely complements the sort of other uh, center-based talks that you have just listened to, uh, whether it's gender or it's media or it's um, uh, diplomacy. Um, we essentially concentrate on what we see as the biggest problem that the world grapples with now and 
into the next 100 years, uh, which is how do you feed a glo growing global population um, while managing the environmental systems and resources uh, on which they depend. So in, essentially, we're all about um, environment, natural resources, uh, transitions towards a, a less resources intensive and more environmentally friendly future. So that is the rationale for SEDEP. And we do a lot of, almost all of this work, but not exclusively, set in low middle income countries, uh, but equally involving um, the, the global community um, and, and its environmental responsibilities. Um, and uh, we are, like the other sectors that you've heard about, extremely interdisciplinary. This is our um, this is basically our USP, uh, if you want to see that way. So this is what SELEP does. Uh, let me just describe to you a bit about our programs. We have a very simple structure. We offer two NSCs, both of which are online uh, exclusively. Um, one is in climate change and development, and the other is in sustainable development. Um, and these have been programs that have evolved from a suite of programs that we used to run before and over a period of time they consolidated and um, sort of essentially uh, built into these two broad areas of uh, teaching that we do, climate change and sustainable development. Running through all these, all the, all the material that we teach is a uh, essentially a social science focus. So uh, climate change, there's various ways of teaching climate change. You might learn in some places the, the science of climate change um, we are very much social science focused, so people are the center of it. Um, and, uh, and while we have uh, the essential science background as a necessary first step in understanding the, the social issues, it is really the people and society that are a part of uh, the material that we present to you. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so, and we are very interdisciplinary, so we draw upon everything ranging from economics to, uh, to sociology, um, to policy sciences, um, to, 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 to appreciations of gender, politics, history, um, all of this cuts through the material that we present uh, in our online programs. Um, we also have an online camp on campus PhD program in uh, development environment and policy that I'll talk about at the end. Um, so, if, if you look at our course structure, the, the, the structure of our course is essentially is fairly simple. Um, you, students typically take four modules, um, which each carry 30 credits, and they write a fairly substantial dissertation. So the dissertation, like in a couple of other centers, is right at the core of what uh, students engage in. It gives them the chance to zone in on their particular areas of interest, uh, whether it's a region or it's a particular topic and develop that through the, their studies as they go along. So um, the way in which we designed this, uh, we've got a structure where you first do a first module, which is typically what we call a core module, um, 16 weeks, and then you do eight weeks of dissertation, initial thinking, developing a topic, and then you do another module, and then when that finishes, you do more dissertation work. So the dissertation work is essentially interspersed between uh, the modules. Um, so you continue developing your dissertation all through the program, uh, which is uh, typically a two-year program, but uh, people can uh, stay on the program for up to five years. So it really suits the kind of people who are um, who have limited time, um, who are perhaps living in other parts of the world, um, and who are essentially wanting to um, upgrade their skills or, or, or uh, pick up new skills in these areas. Um, and so it is built around uh, people with those constraints. Um, so if you look at the actual modules uh, in these MSCs, um, if you were doing climate change development, for example, um, you would do a core module in climate change development, which brings in all the basic arguments around uh, climate change, uh, adaptation, resilience, and so on. Um, on the other hand, if you're doing sustainable development, it would bring in theories of sustainable development, um, uh, in a core module, so you'll do one of those as a core, and then you'll have a whole bunch of electives to choose from. Uh, so I've set out here a sample of the electives that are available, it's climate change adaptation, low carbon development, energy and development, food security, global environmental change, urban sustainability, poverty, water and land management. But that's not, the list is not limited to that. You can, you've heard about the very exciting modules that other centers um, in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies offer, now we have the ability for you to pick uh, online modules from those centers. So for example, you could 
decided to do uh, gender and sexuality uh, online course from the Center for Gender Studies, or you might do a media course, or you might do a diplomacy uh, module if you're, if you're interested in that. Um, so we are set up to for you to pick and choose electives from across our offerings in different centers. And that, that I think makes for a really exciting um, uh, way to tailor your particular interest. So again, uh, where do our students come from and where do they go to? Uh, the nice thing is we have a huge variety of academic backgrounds. So we do not require that you have studied, for example, economics or that you need um, sociology or whatever it is. We have people ranging from those who study ecology and conservation um, to people who study social anthropology, people who study history, a variety of backgrounds. What is really important is good performances in the background and a willingness to be genuinely interdisciplinary and, and, and engage in, in the material in a interdisciplinary way and learn, learn from the other students as well. We also have a hugely diverse levels of experience amongst our student body. Um, many of them are newly graduated students who have just finished coming off a degree to fairly senior management in international organizations, people who are just looking to upgrade their, um, their uh, knowledge, but who are already holding fairly senior positions. Uh, so you'd be surprised um, at the kind of people who sign up, who you might, be, you might think are extremely busy people, um, who somehow manage to still squeeze in the time to, to, to engage in the programs and study and complete them. And, uh, and, and I'm always struck by and amazed by uh, how these people manage their time. So it's a whole range of people and everyone in between. Uh, a range of professional backgrounds. So it could be somebody in NGO management, it could be somebody very much in the field who is on a day-to-day -day basis um, talking to people um, and uh, you know essentially dealing with development at the front line as it were. Uh, two people who are doing, for example, working in the city, working in financial accounting. Um, so again, I'm quite amazed by the sorts of people who um, actually do our courses and, and the range of uh, backgrounds that they come from, and they learn tremendously from each other. And, and there's this, this, this discussions which, which happen, and, and you have people from these different experiences and different backgrounds talking. It's, it's fascinating to observe. Um, what, what do our uh, students do when they finish? Well, many of them use their qualifications, new qualifications, to move up their career ladder. So, uh, quite often, people find that they've hit a ceiling. Um, and unless they have another advanced qualification in a specific area, let's say uh, their department or ministry or whatever is um, now taken on a climate change role or a sustainable development role, they find that to make that next move, they have to um, actually get a qualification. Some people are actually trying to change careers. So there are many people, and I have this case, I mentioned financial accounting there because we had a person from, um, from a major bank, um, um, very well established, who essentially wanted to quit the whole thing and um, uh, you know um, look for a uh, new meaning in life. It's essentially, you know, uh, they were worried about climate change, they wanted to learn about climate change, and so they signed up to a program as a way of actually moving into a completely different career. Um, and there are people, of course, who also transition towards advanced research degrees uh, who actually want to do something slightly different. Um, so which brings me nicely to the next slide, which is about if there are any people here uh, interested in actually an advanced research degree, we do offer an on-campus offering, which again, it's called a PhD pathway in development, environment, and policy. And the feature again is interdisciplinarity, and it's set up to enable students to do an interdisciplinary PhD study uh, with a policy focus. Um, and the way in which it's set up is that, for example, you can have joint supervision for somebody in um, in, in our center or in our school, but you could be co supervising somebody in, say, history, and that's your other discipline that you're interested in, or even some site. Um, um, and there was a discussion earlier about the Bloomsbury area where um, there are um, other colleges. So, for example, you could take, you could have a joint supervisor uh, in the London School of Hygiene, which is a major public health institution. So, it is set up to do, make those kinds of collaborations possible. Um, and, and you can do this part-time as well. That's, that's, that's quite often very useful for students. Um, and typically, students will do some research methods, but they'll also do modules from across the US and other institutions. Uh, so climate change adaptation, resilience, renewable energy, energy and climate policy, these are things that we're known for and that we uh, specialize in. Um, but I'm going to stop there pretty much. And thank you very much for your time. Again, if you have any questions at all, 
you're most welcome to contact me b dot shankar s h a n k a r at soas or ac dot uk i'd be happy to talk to you uh, or direct you to the right person thank you i'll just stand this back now so thank you very much everyone and thank you for joining us uh, we've got maybe a couple of questions that have appeared on the slide but i just wanted to emphasize why we called interdisciplinary studies and to understand what it means in a sense, what we encourage is thinking outside boxes. So if you are interested in kind of the question around climate change, so how can we look at climate change through through the gender perspective? You know, how does it impact gender uh, issues? How does it impact equalities? Is, uh, on another level, we can think about it in terms of development. But also we can think about it in terms of media and communication. What are the narratives around which um, the climate change debate has, uh, has been moving into? What, what is forgotten in those narratives and what do we need to emphasize? So in a sense, we are moving towards trying to think about themes that matter to all of us as human beings across the world and trying to look at each of them by looking at uh, the, the ways in which the different centers can contribute to the debate. Um, and we encourage our students to also take part in that debate, not only through the classrooms, but also through um, podcasts, uh, through um, you know, kind of conferences, but also uh, through blogs. So really encouraging you to look at the uh, different center blogs that we have. I believe we had a question to Dan around the uh, study tours. So Dan, you Hi. can take that. Uh, well, we have a range of study tours these days. Um, for the campus uh, programs, I think there's a particular question about uh, Geneva, where we've been to for some years, or we may diversify and do uh, Vienna for a change next year. But anyway, uh, we go for a week. Uh, to Geneva um, by train, it's much more convenient and uh, ecologically friendly. And uh, we have a range of programs, partly organised by the UN and partly organised by ourselves, some hosted by the uh, British government. And we have uh, the opportunity to um, interface with officials, quite senior officials, from maybe a dozen different. Uh, UN agencies and uh, NGOs based in Geneva dealing with uh, human rights, humanitarian relief, all the way through to the uh, uh, telecommunications union which deals with the, the internet. So the broad range of institutions uh, in Geneva and part of that also is that we host a diplomatic reception. Um, so. Uh, students typically will be in touch with the diplomats from their country and invite them to a diplomatic reception and we'll also invite a range of UN staff and uh, students use this for networking opportunities and the final day um, of the tour typically groups of students will be hosted uh, informally uh, by their uh, nation state and uh, to give you one example without being too specific uh, one of our students was very disappointed uh, that uh, their ambassador had not turned up at the reception. The visiting card was there, the badge was there, uh, they'd accepted, hadn't come. So the student asked, uh, could they go uh, visit the mission? So they did, they went to the random doorbell uh, the mission. Uh, the reception said, oh, we thought it was tonight, not last night. Uh, to cut a long story short, uh, the uh, person concerned uh, got an internship, they had a job at the Human Rights Council, uh, and is now a special assistant to the foreign minister within, I think, an 18 month trajectory of dealing with that rejection in a highly constructive way. Um, the skills were, in addition to the uh, traditional analytical skills, uh, we find uh, students are trained in uh, media presentation skills, which doesn't just help them uh, in the workplace, but uh, we also uh, prepare people for uh, public presentations and media. Um, the negotiating skills uh, prove, have proven very valuable to students. Indeed, I've had emails from those who've gone on a year or two and found themselves negotiating, saying how useful it was to have this training in negotiating skills. And 
one of the most common, I think, commonly useful ones is in the uh, policy analysis. That is, uh, on a governmental or an NGO track, you're taking an issue and writing up a policy brief for your boss about how they should deal with a particular situation. And these sorts of skills are rarely taught um, in a postgraduate level um, in, uh, across the sector, and indeed even at some of the elite uh, US schools, uh, these sorts of skills are only dealt with um, marginally. And the people we have doing it are uh, current and former uh, media personalities. You find yourself in a room being taught by someone, that's a familiar face, yes, I saw you on television last night. Uh, <laughs> Uh, presenting the news, uh, and then on the negotiating side, uh, we have a team uh, who uh, train countries to take on diplomatic roles. And so, for example, a few years ago, um, a, uh, the state of Jordan had to, at I think 48 hours' notice, uh, take a seat on the Security Council because Saudi Arabia had declined for political reasons for the first time in history to take control on the Security Council. And the team that Jordan brought in to train them uh, are the same tra team that will train you. So hopefully that gives a, a reasonable survey of what we have on offer. But happy, happily take more questions. And the same for the uh, for all of us. If there are any more questions, can you see any more questions? If there are no more questions, we'll probably say thank you for coming. And uh, thank you for some of the questions, and hopefully you can get in touch with us. And you're very welcome to email me at danfash at dp27 at soas.ac.uk. And dinamata at dm27 at soas.ac.uk. Thank you.